Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Wakefield Risk OS Computer Club, albeit in a virtual fashion. Um, the COVID-19 outbreak has obviously completely disrupted our meetings and caused us to postpone the show for a year, which was a massive disappointment, but looked at in the wider context of the immense destruction, oh, it's not destruction, but disruption that this has caused and distress and so forth in all walks of life and business, um, postponing the show doesn't seem quite so bad. So we'll, we'll bounce back. Um, the lady who uh, you saw, you, who let you in at first, it, who appears to be on the planet Gallifrey with the orange background is Ruth Gunstone, who's a committee member. Uh, my name's Rick Sterry. I'm the chairman. I'm not sure if that's a reward or a punishment. Um, jury's out on that one. <laughs> so um, I won't waffle. We'll, we'll crack on. So welcome, everybody. Um, we've probably not seen a few of you except maybe at the show. Um, certainly not at regular meetings because obviously travel distance for some of you makes it quite impractical. So I will hand over to Steve Fryer, who you'll probably know, uh, edits our newsletter and uh, maintains um, our two websites, the show site and the club site. So uh, over to you, Steve, and um, I shall attempt to mute myself. Can, can we just butt in first and just remind people if they want to see um, the, the, the speaker's screen or the speaker in the main window, if you go to the top right hand corner in the PC slash Mac version, uh, you can change between the speaker view and the um, uh, grid view. So or you can gallery choose whichever view. So, gallery view, that's the one, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so speaker view is the one you want, and then you'll just see the person who's actually giving the talk rather than lots of little thumbnails of people. So we will be trying to share a risk OS desktop with you fairly shortly. So that may disrupt your screen display a little bit. But one of the points of tonight is to try and work out how well this may or may not work. We shall see. And we are actually recording this session as well. So um, hopefully if anybody wants to see uh, the presentation but couldn't join us on this evening, then uh, we'll be able to make the recording available to them as well. So that should be OK. OK, so over to Steve. OK, thanks, Rick. Um, I'm going to start by just trying to share a um, risk-op, risk OS desktop with you all. Um, if I can find the right one, right window to share. So, yay! You should now have seen. He says, "My screen has all just moved around, which is handy." Um, where have you all gone? Ah, there you are. So you should now be able to see. Uh, Risk OS Direct Desktop, I hope. I'm not sure how much of this is actually going to be important tonight. Um, a lot of this chat is going to be fairly arm wavy, so if you can't actually make out what's going going on on screen, it may not actually matter. And one of the things I'm actually interested in finding out this evening is how well this actually works, because obviously going forward, it might be quite a useful thing to know if we can actually do software demonstrations on screen um, in this sort of format. Um, but for this evening, there's going to be um it's going to be mostly chat and maybe a little bit of stuff going on on the screen that isn't absolutely essential to what to um to actually following what's going on um if you can't hear me at any point or you can't see anything on screen that you think is actually important either sort of wave somehow or use the raise hands function or chat, type something in the chat screen so that Ruth or I can see it and we'll um, make sure, try and do our best to make sure that, uh, that we can sort the problem out if we can. So, um, on to the actual sort of subject for what we're going to talk about this evening. Um, given that it was sort of the first time we've tried this, we thought we'd make it a fairly, I was going to say simple topic, but um, hopefully interesting for people who haven't come across it yet. And that is Risk OS Direct, which was initially announced back at the London show last year, I believe, and actually launched at the Southwest show down in Bristol in February. Um, I suspect a lot of people have heard about it. I'd certainly not actually looked at it until a couple of weeks ago in any great detail. Um, 
So I thought it might be interesting to actually walk, actually go through what it is, have a look at it, and just see what it's what it is, what its purpose is, and what what it might how useful it might be to all of us and to people who aren't currently involved with the Risk Coast platform. So Risk Coast Direct is basically a distribution of Risk OS, which I'll come back to in a second exactly what I mean by that, um, which is designed to run on a Raspberry Pi um, and to be approachable to users who aren't familiar with our system. Um, it's been it's, it's um, designed to be distributed as an 8 gig SD card image, so you can download it off the internet or um, potentially get hold of an SD card, a physical card with it on. And it comes complete with its own look and feel, a load of bundled applications, and a video series to back it up on YouTube, of which more a bit later. Um, the idea behind it seems to be to provide a ready to go system that new users can stick on a card and sort of plug into a Raspberry Pi that they might have lying about. Um, the other idea seems to be that it might also be possible, at least in more normal times when people are actually meeting up occasionally in person, to take a pile of cards along something like a Raspberry Pi Jam and hand them out to people who might be interested but might have never actually come across risk OS before. Um, it's a collaboration between risk OS developments, who own risk OS, as I'm sure everybody now knows, and TSW Holdings. Um, the former are Andrew Wormsley and Richard Brown, who I'm certain will need no introduction to people. Um, TSW Holdings is Tom Williamson, who some of the Wakefield group will remember if you make it along to our February 28 meeting up in Wakefield. Um, he came to visit us then wearing his IDENT computer hat. Um, and at the time, he was, he was designing and manufacturing various, various risk OS systems based around a Raspberry Pi. Um, there was the Micro One, which was a do it yourself sort of cardboard box with a keyboard and a for a Pi slot into. And he moved on to the, or we had moved on to the IDENT CE range, I think, and various other similar, similar computers, which were 3D printed plastic boxes, which stacked up in various Lego-like formats to produce your sort of build-it-yourself computer, effectively. Um, and Tom also is the main face behind the Wi-Fi Sheet YouTube channel, which um, is a slightly geeky sort of tech um, channel looking at retro computing and similar sort of things as far as I can see. Um, back in 2018, um, which is obviously before the point where Castle sold themselves to risk off development, um, IDENT actually licensed Risk OS from Castle back in the days when it was still required to be licensed from, from the owners and produced their own IDENT branded version of Risk OS, which they used in the micro, on the Micro One. Um, this was customized, I think, mainly by Tom to provide a better introduction to the platform for new users. Um, there was quite a slant, I think. I never actually really saw a copy in the flesh beyond what I think he had at the meeting when we came to visit us. But he seemed to have quite a slant towards the BBC Micro era and looking at, you know, hands-on basic and that sort of stuff. Um, and the distribution itself had a quite had its own sort of look and feel, including the inevitable um, stylized switch icon that he, pretty much every version of Risk OS these days seems to need to have to escape from the standard cog. Um, since then, I don't seem to have sort of taken a step back from the Risk OS market, although some of their cases, the I don't see range in that, I think, was still available through third parties. Um, but now it seems that Tom's customized Risk OS has actually effectively seen a new lease of life in the form of a base for Risk OS Direct. So I think that's kind of where it came from in, in the sort of the sort of backstory to where it's arrived from. Um, I said it's a distribution, but I suppose the question is, in some ways, what does that mean? I mean, we're kind of vaguely familiar, I think, most of us, at least having heard the term distribution in the context of Linux systems and other operating systems. But in a risk OS context, it's it's basically a ready-made package, a risk OS package that comes with a standard build of risk OS 5.27 from sometime in February or March, depending on how you get hold of a copy. Um, and also has all the standard hard disk components that you would expect to find if you went and downloaded them off the risk OS open website. But in addition to that, it also contains a number of third party apps um, and some customizations to the boot sequence and some graphical changes and tweaks and twiddles um, so that it's got a bit more of a kind of customized look and feel and this presents itself in a way that presumably in this case, Tom thinks is more appealing to people who are new to the platform. 
Um, this isn't actually that unusual. I mean, Risk OS Open have actually done exactly the same thing for the Pi. Um, you can go to the Risk OS Open the, um, website and download either a standard SD card image or you can purchase SD cards for the Pi for them from them, or you can go and get the noobs um, distribution from Raspberry Pi Foundation that contains Risk OS as a ready to go package, or you can even go for Epic from Risk OS Open, um, which is the more expensive bundle that comes complete with operating system, a load of free applications, and also some commercial applications that are packaged up as a sort of um, starter pack for people, again, who are new to the platform. Um, and dealers like Arcomp and CJ, I suspect, certainly Arcom do, I'm guessing CJ probably do as well, provide their users with additional bits and pieces installed on machines that they buy. So it's not a new concept in a sense, but it's in the risk platform, I suppose it's a bit, it's a little bit unusual in the sense that it's being done by a third party, not as part of a standard operating system distribution or, or coming with a bit of hardware. Um, and I guess in many ways, if you want to try and draw the parallel, it's a bit like a Linux distribution, where, I mean, for example, Debian, Ubuntu, and Linux Mint are all versions of the same system, um, but each one is presented in a slightly different way. Um, if you're sort of hardcore Linux, Unix speak, you'd probably go for Debian, whereas if you wanted to use it commercially, you might want Ubuntu. And if you were an end user who wanted a fairly easy introduction to the system and just something that powered up and worked when you used it, you'd probably go for Linux Mint, maybe. It's a similar kind of idea with Risco's Direct, I guess, and the Raspberry Pi. So an obvious question then is, who is it actually aimed at? Um, and there's been quite a lot of debate about this on the on the um, Risco's Open Forums over the past few months. Um, the answer, it seems, is probably anyone who wants to use Risco as a Pi. Um, this is clearly intended to bring in new users. Um, but Richard and Andrew were both very clear when I spoke to them at the Southwest show that they wanted it to be considered a distribution that any risk OS user, new, present, long-standing, someone who's been around since before which since Acorn started, could consider as a risk, version of risk OS if they just want to get, get it up and running on a Raspberry Pi quickly and easily. They can go and download the, the, the um, image, put, put it on an SD card, stick it in the Pi, and away they go. Um, the other question I asked Andrew and Richard down at the Southwest, down in Bristol, because I was I was a little bit curious having seen the discussions on the forums, was where does this leave the Risk OS Open distribution, including noobs and the Epic that we've already talked about? And the answer, it seems, is pretty much where they always have been. Um, Risk OS developers don't, don't seem to view Direct as a competitor. They view it as a complement to the raw distributions and not a replacement. Um, one interesting thing Andrew did say in passing when I was talking to him there at the show was that they were a bit concerned by the fact that Rule weren't updating their version very often. Um, I mean, at the moment, if you go and download it, it's still on Risk OS 5.24, which is the last stable release from April 2018, um, which isn't unreasonable, but it actually predates when the operating system is open sourced and relicensed. And there seemed to be some suggestion, although Andrew was a bit vague as to the exact specifics, that Castle may still have an interest in the number of versions of Risk OS 5.24 and 5.25 that are still. Out there, in, out there in circulation. Um, that said, presumably since Risk OS development actually own Castle now, presumably they get the licensing. I don't, so it didn't entirely make sense, but that comment was made. Um, that said, before we move on, it's also probably worth mentioning that Rule are clearly in the process of updating their distribution because developers of software will know they're probably, or probably be aware that there were some emails going out at the moment checking for updates before a new distribution is put together. So it looks as though an update for that might be in the offing as well. Maybe when 5.28 gets released, um, it was supposed to have been out in April at some computer show, but that didn't happen. So it's still in limbo. While um, I presume Risk OS Open are tidying up loose ends and fixing some of the remaining bugs that are coming to light in the wind. So Risk OS Direct comes as uh, as an SD card image, um, as I'd say, if you if you if you were at the Southwest show, you could have picked up a card and bought I think bought a card off Viscos Development. Maybe they were giving them away. I didn't didn't actually ask that question. Um, and you can easily go and download a copy of the image off their website and stick it on a card of your own. What sparked my interest in this a little bit more was that last month I noticed that RPCMU 0.9.3, which is the most, which again we looked like it was timed possibly for a release around about a computer event last month, um, was launched. And for the first time, came with a couple of what they called easy start bundles, which are ready-to-go hard disk images for people to download and play with alongside the emulator. Um, 
obviously for quite a while now you've been able to download risk os5 from risk os open and stick it in rptmu and get a risk risk os5 risk bc um but now you can download straight from um rptmu's website a ready to go bundle for risk os 3.7 if you want to go back to the 90s and experience a 1990s risk pc um and the other bundle, which was much slightly more interesting immediately, was Risk OS Direct. And that's actually what we're looking at this evening and what you can probably see on, hopefully see on your screen at the moment. Um, it's got a little bit of branding differences. So the actual desktop background says RPCMU edition powered by um, RPCMU. Um, and they're actually, one thing I haven't seen mentioned is there are actually differences in the disk images as well. Um, the RPCMU version is actually missing files and applications that are in the Raspberry Pi version. Although, to be fair to them, it seems to be mainly stuff that wouldn't work on a RISC PC because either it expects modern hardware or it expects things like GPIO pins that are on a Raspberry Pi but aren't on a RISC PC, so they make no sense to run, to um, to include them. To make it a bit easier to actually explain to actually go through the two versions, I've copied them across onto my image for tonight and. We'll have a look at them or we'll mention them if we go past, but they won't actually work on the risk PC. So I think it's time now to actually start having a look at what you get if you were to um, install a copy of Risk OS Direct onto your Raspberry Pi. So I've got a version here. I've done a bit of fiddling with it to reset it back to how it would have been before I'd actually booted the machine. And if I shut down and restart this, and hopefully this won't mess up the video connection, it reboots just like in any other version of um, Risk OS. It's a development build, so you get a long list of modules scroll past the screen as it goes. You get a slightly modified splash screen come up um, just to recognize that it's Risk OS Direct and not the standard rule version of it. Um, and then you get dumped to the desktop with a big disclaimer. Um, this only comes up once you're pleased to know. So the first time you started, it comes up and basically tells you none of it's our fault and it's all somebody else's problem. Um, don't infringe any copyright, that sort of stuff. Once you close that down, you won't see it again. And so we've now got this branded desktop. So it's clearly an attempt to present a kind of risk of threat look and feel. Um, We've got the slightly modified switcher icon. If you want to actually see where the heritage of this potentially comes from, um, the Ident OS branding that Tom was using a couple of years ago had a very similar logo to the switcher logo here, but just had the arrow pointing the other way, and it was in red and blue, I think, rather than all shades blue. But it does give a bit of a nod to the heritage of um, Risk OS Direct. Um, and then you've got a few applications sat on the um, on the pin board ready to go, so you can actually quickly get to some of the supposedly more interesting um, bits of software that you might want to play with if you're new to the system. Um, it also comes with a few slightly curious customizations um, installed in boot. So I did a bit of a dig through this to see what it was actually doing that was special. Um, FAT32FS is running a standard, which is good because it means that somebody can plug a uh, FAT32 USB stick in and it'll just be red, which is what you'd expect. They've also got any mode installed a standard, which is also good because that means that it'll handle it, it'll work with any screen mode that you throw at it. And they're also running special FX as standard, um, presumably just to improve the look and feel of some applications that need it. On the um, or in a similar vein to any mode, something I did notice is if we change screen mode, and we'll just have a go at doing this, you now get a box up that says your desktop has um, desktop mode has changed. Do you wish to accept it? And if I don't accept it, it'll revert back to where we were before. If you accept it, you can change mode. And anyone who uses any other any other computer systems other than Risk OS should be familiar with something like that because Windows, Mac OS, Linux all do it, and it makes a lot of sense. If you manage to change your monitor out of a screen mode, that it, sorry, manage to change your computer out of a mode that the monitor will accept, then you don't have to remember how to type your way out of it blind on the keyboard. So that's a good move. The other thing that I noticed is running not on the RPCMU version but on the Raspberry Pi is um, 
um, read DHCP from Andrew Conroy, Outlast Unlimited, um, which is there. And if you've actually got a Raspberry Pi requiring a network, a physical network connection, it'll detect the cable being unplugged, detect you plugging it back in and reset the system so that it actually picks up new IP addresses off DHCP, which is one of RiscOS's main failings um, on any other system, RiscOS system. You've actually got to reboot the machine if you change your network connection, which kind of not something that anybody else out in the real world expects anymore. So it's quite nice to see that running there. And also, I noticed in some of Tom's videos, um, it can detect the, the loss of a network connection and actually pops up at the box on the bottom of the screen saying that you've lost your network connection which again is something that people from familiar with Windows and the like will be um, will be familiar with. Um, there's a copy of Organizer, the free version, which is from 20, 2008. Um, I think it was the last version that Chris Morrison released before he, he passed it on to um, the care of Nigel Wilmot and Martin Avison. Martin Avison, that comes as standard and runs as standard. And Software that's booted up as the machine starts, so it's available, includes things such as OmniClient, Avalanche if you want to do VNC connections, the Otter web browser, strong ed for text editing, Impression Style, which we'll come back to in a bit, Open Vector, and David Pilling or DP Scan. There is one slight curiosity which I found, which I think has been discussed on the forums, and I think Andrew wrongly said it was a mistake or probably be getting taken out, but as standard, it comes with a key mapper module installed which can be used to swap key presses on the keyboard around and as standard as it ships here the window the window key and the menu key on the keyboard those are the ones either side of the space bar um, are mapped to the menu button on the mouse which means they disappear totally which means that if you go and try to actually configure actions for what this goes five calls a macro key so that you can run star commands and so on by pressing either the window keys and the keyboard or the menu key, you'll find it won't work because those keys have actually totally disappeared. Um, and it also remaps the right alt key somewhere, which I couldn't make any sense of out of the documentation for key mapper. Um, and not having a Raspberry Pi is a bit difficult to actually test that. Um, as I say, there was a suggestion on the forum on the forum that that's probably a bug which is going to get removed. So hopefully in the future build that will disappear. It's not, to be fair, given massive problems, although in RPCMU the old keys don't work anyway, so I wouldn't notice the wouldn't notice the loss of that. So having got to a desktop, um, what can we do with the system? Well, if we click on apps to start with, we'll see there's quite a load of bundle stuff that actually turns up as standard in the build now. Um, we've got all the familiar risk OS stuff, so we've got alarm, um, chars, close up. Draw, edit, paint, help, maestro, on the client, calculator, um, and then there's a whole load of other bundle stuff which um, which may or may not be potentially useful. What did strike me is there's actually no explanation or documentation or or sort of indication of what the stuff's there to do. So you can double click on things. Um, so start up Avalanche, for example. He's asking me if I want to click, connect, make a VNC connection somewhere I've got nothing I can connect to. Um, and it's Risk OS, so you can click menu if you can work out how to do that. Choose help and you can read the documentation. Um, so we've got VNC clients, cash book in there, which is personal account software. Um, DP scan if you want to edit bitmap images and maybe work with a scanner, although I'm not sure how many of the train drivers are included. There's Fireworks and Pipe Dream for those who want spreadsheets. Um, so the Otter browser is included. Um, Strong Ed as an alternative text editor. And there's Impression Style. So I tried running that. So I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. It's been a while since I played with Impression. And it says you need Emula, 26 bit emulation software to run Impression Style on Risk OS 5, which is to be expected. But there's not a lot of information there in that apps window as to how I might go about actually sorting that problem out. Um, so we'll pass by that for a second. Um, also included, and in quite this is quite a nice touch, um, our comp spring store is there, so we can go online and download software. And it will update itself 
Um, it's actually it's a fairly old version that comes as standard, but the first thing it will do is update itself to the new version. And you then get a choice of all the software that's available um, through the Pling store to download and play with. I, so I know I've certainly looked at the meetings before. We may come back to it at this time towards the end. Um, but the other nice little touch is Pac-Man, which is packaging handles packaging for Risco. It's rather like Pling store. It'll go on, go online and actually download um, software for you without having to go looking for a um, website. But the difference is. It will actually keep track of new releases as they come out and download and install them for you. Um, so you can set it off to go and download the package information and update its list. We'll close that and upgrade all. There are currently no upgrades, so everything on this machine is up to date. And what I did, what I did think was quite nice was that. Um, They've actually, where applications are supplied through packaging, this distribution uses packaging to supply the up to, to provide the application. So it means the updates will effectively get pushed out to users who have got this distro installed. Um, which means that, for example, somebody playing around with this would never need to worry about updating PipeDream because Pac-Man would sort it out whenever a new update got released. Um, Pac-Man would, as long as they ran Pac-Man occasionally, it would actually go and download the update for PipeDream. Similarly, FTPC, um, PDF Viewer, uh, Strong Help, and various other applications. So that's quite a nice touch, I thought, and it certainly simplifies keeping track of um, keeping track of what you've, you know, what software you've got and what software has been supplied to people. Um, there's a copy of NetServe supplied, which is last year's stable release so it actually misses quite a lot of the security updates or the security certificate updates that have been released over the past year but to be fair when you when you run it um hoping it will actually start up and run fairly quickly you get the option to download the latest net surf fairly easily so assuming i've got an internet connection here so that's it's not such a big deal that um there isn't the version is a year out of date, and to be fair, the the, the disk image comes from February March time, which predates the most recent NetSurf release. Anyway, um, one other little curiosity, which I found is there's a little there's a little application called Basic, and I'm curious to know what this did, so I tried running it. And what it does is drop me at a BBC micro-like prompt, which then lets me type in Basic commands. So I can. So we can type short basic programs and then it helpfully tells me I can type quit to exit and I go back to the desktop. Um, I guess it's a nice little gimmick, but I have to admit I, was, I did wonder how many people who might be coming to risk arrest from other platforms don't necessarily expect to be interacting with BBC Basic on the system in the in a style of a BBC Micro, but is a nice historical touch, I guess, and there is some mention of it somewhere in the in the videos, which I will come back to shortly. Um, so that's, that's the apps folder, and if we dig a little bit deeper, we we'll just go into the actual hard drive. On the Raspberry Pi, of course, this would be SDFS, and there'd be an SD card on the on the icon bar, but the contents of the disk is the same. We get a note telling us that this is the RPC ME version of the Easy Start Bundle. I don't know what's on the Raspberry Pi version in terms of notes here, but this basically says that there's any problems with the distribution, it's the RPC ME people's fault and not, not risk cost developments. Um, and then we've got a load of software spread around various folders on the disk, which again are available for people to play with. And I have to admit, this is where I started to get a little bit confused about what was on the disk. Um, obviously, apps contains the apps we've just seen that end up in the apps folder on the icon bar. Audio video gives us a bunch of things for re listening to MP3s and playing um, video files and so on. There's Kino Amp, um, FFmpeg for viewing films, FFmpeg for converting file formats, so videos and so on. And player and digital CD will let you listen to music net radio will let you listen to radio stations on the internet and sample ed will let you um will let you edit um sound files which is fairly reasonable um 
one thing that I did notice with all of these things is that they're all actually installed. So if you go through, everything is set up ready to go. So I can actually run digital CD straight away. Um, he says, except doesn't like doesn't like the CD drive. That may, to be fair to them, be an artifact to the fact I'm running it on our PCME here. Um, so everything's set up to run and it's all, everything's installed in boot. But despite that, they still, they still provide you with all the install files right next to the applications without any real indication as to what they are. So you get digital CD, you also get BCD res, which is actually installed within boot somewhere else. And you get all the modules to stick inside the system, which again, has already been done for you. So I couldn't help feeling that for a new user, it might be more approachable if, this, if all the install stuff was kept somewhere separate out of the way of all the applications. Um, so that you know that the stuff that's in the application folders is stuff you can just run and use. And the, if you want to, if you want to go away and dig through the installation installation files, they're somewhere else on the drive, maybe documented, so we can find them. But I guess it's a minor quibble. Um, you can say there's an player there, yet another copy of the system. Um, FFmpeg is for converting audio files, and Kino Amp, if you want to view videos, can do. They're quite slow on this because it's a Linux machine pretending to be a RISC PC, so it's not exactly a fast system to be playing videos on. So I'll spare you that that pain. Um, the range of diversions sat on the disk. A little bit confusing me. It's not the full set of files that you will get if you go to risk as open and download them because some of them have been put somewhere else on the disk. So there's a range of different games as well. So alongside the standard stuff that comes with risk OS, we've got a few of Chris Hall's games and utilities. Um, there's a copy of Doom, which does run, again, a little bit slowly on here. Um, for those who have not seen the RISC-OS 5 distribution recently, Meteor, recently Meteors is um, a fairly standard uh, part of this image these days since RISC-OS Open rescued the source code for it. We can play Hopper, for those who remember, remember this from the days of their um, BBC Micro or Electron, I can certainly on memories of that, um, and a range of card games. I'm not going to go through all of them on the screen, but it's quite, it's quite, there's a good selection of games that people can play. Um, in keeping with the, uh, the sort of push towards making RiscOS and the Raspberry, Risk OS and the Raspberry Pi apps being a sort of hands-on programming type of system, there's, not, there's a programming folder as well with a whole bunch of bits of software and tools that might be of interest to developers. Um, and it's, it's quite a good selection. You've got App Basic, uh, which is quite an easy toolbox based means of generating basic programs for the WIMP. Um, I can't remember how long ago it was we did a meeting on writing App Basic programs, but um, you, might, you may well find it in newsletter archives. Um, it's sufficiently easy that one of our members brought along a handful of um, computer, uh, RISC-OS computers one evening and basically had the club, all of the club members sat around tables writing their own basic programs, so desktop programs by the end of the evening. So it's, it's that simple to, to make it work. So that's good to see that in there. Um, there's Dr. Wimp as well, which is a basic library if you want to get up and write, running WIMP, writing WIMP programs um, using BASIC. And there's some documentation in there for how to do that. Um, if you've got a Raspberry Pi, there's GPIO related stuff, um, which obviously can't run on the RISC PC because it won't recognize it. There's a C compiler without apparently much documentation at all. I mean, there is stuff that comes with GCC, but it's as impenetrable as GCC's documentation usually is to a newcomer. Um, and there's very little else to actually give you a clue as to how it works or how you might go about generating software with it. Um, there's toolbox utilities, which you may need for AppBasic. Um, but again, there's no documentation to go with those really to explain, explain what they do. And then there's a handful of other sort of more modern languages or more potentially more interesting languages that are worth perhaps just quickly mentioning. Um, Risk Lua, which is Gavin Wraith's um, sort of pet project. Um, there's an up to date version of that available. I will admit I know nothing at all about Lua, so I'm not even going to try and demonstrate it. 
Um, Gavin is actually in the process of writing up the documentation at the moment, I believe, and you can find more if you go and search on the rule forums in the last few days. There's been quite a lot of discussion about that, and it looks like he's got a fair number of in-depth tutorials online which are worth a look at. Um, and there's Python, which is another risk OS developments project, which is certainly worth a mention. Um, I wrote about this a couple of months ago in the newsletter about getting it up and running uh, on risk OS 5. And that is Python 3 Alpha 4, which is supplied. Um, the, the work on actually porting Python 3 has been done by Chris Johns, and it's been largely supported, I believe, by risk loss developments. I'm not quite sure what form the support has taken, whether it's financial or kind of development support or whatever, but they've certainly been involved in making sure the project happens and, is, um, and they consider it a useful thing to do. Um, and it's certain. I think it's fair to say it certainly is an important, an important addition to the RiskOS platform um, because it's something that users will find on other systems. If you if you interact with Raspberry Pi running a more conventional Linux, you'll almost certainly be programming using Python rather than anything else because it is pretty much ubiquitous nowadays for sort of a, a simple and easy to get into programming language. Um, the RiskOS version is a little bit cryptic in that it starts up as a sort of command line tool, but it's a lot simpler if you just create a text, go to a text editor, um, and create a cells. I'm not sure why that started in the like that. We can create ourselves a, little, a very simple little program. Unfortunately, my typing while speaking isn't necessarily a, a skill I've uh, I've mastered, and then that should be a little bit of Python. Um, he says optimistically, if I save that. Python 3 file. It should, assuming I've got it right, just run out of the box, and it does. Um, so that's quite a simplistic example, but it, it just works, which is really nice because it actually took me. If you read the article I wrote a few months back, say in the in the rock, it took me probably best part of a day of fiddling around to try and get it up and running on risk os5 without having used any of the shared libraries before um it just worked on this distribution so that's that's a really nice touch and top marks to the guy at the team putting it together for getting that working um i think it's hard to underestimate how many people will expect to find python on a modern on a modern computer system and it is a lot easier to write simple programs in python for doing all manner of things from hardware control to math problems to all sorts of stuff so it's really good to see RiskOS is gaining support for that. Um, there are some slightly odd things, and this is another example of the, it feels almost like things have just been thrown onto the disk in a way just to kind of put them there. Because I I spotted an application that literally told you there called MessageMon, and I noted that because I can't think, I think I might have written it at some point in the past. Um, it's basically a little tool, a programmer's tool, which is quite low level, and it sits and it snoops on WIMP messages that get passed around between applications when you're saving files or cutting and pasting text between documents. Um, but the point is, it isn't standalone. It requires Martin Everson's reporter to be able to work. And the one thing that is very conspicuous in his absence from the entire disk image is reporter. So they've included a module which isn't actually supplied with the software it needs to actually work. Um, now, admittedly, the documentation for Message Mon does tell you you can go away and download Reporter, but it's unclear why it wasn't included along with it because it would have made more sense to include Reporter and not Message Mon, in my view, rather than the other way around. Um, what else is on the disk? Well, there's we saw this impression style. If we actually go into impression, um, if we go into the application folder itself on the disk, we've actually got a link to Emula, which I can run. Not much documentation on how to get it running, but I know that you, you can run it by double clicking on it. And then now we've got a fully functioning version of impression style. 
Um, and those, for those who've missed that bit of news, Risk Cost Developments now own that and it's now freely available to download, I believe, from their website. If not, you can download it as part of this disk image. Um, so it is free to download from the internet. That was, that's nice to see. Um, there's a bunch of additional utilities as well, which have been dropped in amongst the standard utilities that Risco has. So we've got Change FSI. Doctor is a application launcher, which will allow us to launch applications by, by double clicking on them. Um, I'm just going to close that down. There's a range of other slightly older utilities like Fantastic, InfoZip, InterGIF for generating GIF files, locates file search utility. Um, it's a periodic table utility from Chris Johnson. Um, I'm guessing they got included because they also include Chris Johnson's taken over a whole load of David Billings old software and they've got Snapper and Sync Disks included, which are both incredibly useful tools. Snapper allows you to take screenshots from the desktop. Um, Trying to remember how this works at the moment. If I set Snapper up so it'll use hotkeys for shift and control, I should be able to then just press the shift and control keys on my keyboard and save and grab that window as a as a sprite check and save that to disk. Um, it's an incredibly useful tool if you're writing software manuals or magazine articles. Sync disks allows you to back disks up is again incredibly useful and I used it for many years. Um, Sparkfs strong help. So it's the usual kind of stuff that's in there. Um, again, on a slightly odd front, they've very very helpfully they've set the system up so that as standard printers comes configured with print PDF. Um, again, I probably have to declare an interest in that. Um, and so that it, as standard, if we run printers, it automatically comes configured with a PDF printer driver on the icon bar. Um, and it's all been set up correctly so that it's all linked up to print PDF. And if you try and print from anything, it will generate you a PDF as you expect. But there's no documentation to tell you this anywhere. So if you go to apps, you've got printers somewhere, um, just on the bottom of the screen there, but no print PDF. So somebody coming to that via apps who knows nothing about the system could spend quite a long time wondering why their printouts just disappear into a black hole and never appear because print, without print PDF running, they'll just sit there getting queued up on the hard drive waiting to um, waiting to be converted. Um, there's a bunch of network tools as well. We've already seen Avalanche, FTPC is an FTP client, um, tap email for reading emails. We've talked about read DHCP before. Just a collection of useful bits and pieces. And finally, I think in the software front, there's a bunch of emulation, which if you want to run more sort of legacy software, um, there's a range of options available to you as standard, certainly if you get the Raspberry Pi version. If you download the, the RPCMU version, you'll find some of these folders are missing, presumably because they aren't compatible with RPCMU. Um, but there's a copy of DOSBox, which will run old DOS software and emulation under Risk OS. We've already seen Emula mentioned, although there's very little mention of Emula anywhere in the documentation. Um, so you'd have to kind of stumble across that yourself if you needed to work out why stuff like Impression wasn't running. Um, there's a copy of BBIT, um, so you can run BBC Micro software. And finally, there's a copy of Acorn mode, which I think is something that Archon bundled with their computers. And that will allow you, be quite careful which disk I open here, try that one. Yeah. That will allow you to run old Risk OS 3.1 style software, particularly games, on a modern Risk OS 5 machine by effectively emulating an A5000. And there's a bundle of games there Pac Mania, Mount Professor Mariarty, Swift, Nebula, Speedball 2, which is just included as things that people can play if they want to do so. Um, as I say, none of that runs on the RPCME version, so I can't, can't go through that. Um, and then finally, there's a documents folder, which contains a number of helpful bits and pieces. Uh, there's the Risk OS user guide, and it's quite nice to see that they've actually included the full PDF of what I think is the most recent rule version of the Risk OS 5 user guide book. 
Um, so at least there is um, some documentation there for users if they can find it. Again, I couldn't see any obvious link to that anywhere. So you'd have to you'd have to stumble down through documents and user guide to find that. And then all the files that just come as standard. Um, there's the examples of Pipe Dream. There's a bunch of manuals, and this, this is quite nice. So you've got Beginner's Guide to Win Programming, which was Martin Fox's book, I think. First Steps in Programming, um, First Steps in Programming, which again is Martin Fox, I believe. It's all basic programming. Pipe Dream manuals. Um, awesome documentation for print PDF from Director. I haven't found those. Um, Private Eye, so there's a few more software documents there. And the original Acorn versions of the programmer's reference manuals, so they're sort of 25 years out of date, but at least it gets you going. Risk growth hasn't changed that much in the last 25 years, so it's certainly a good start. Um, and then I'll come, I'll come back to that in a second. So that's a quick kind of wander around the disk image and a view of some of the stuff that's actually, or pretty much most of the stuff that's actually included. Um, so, I suppose to sort of wrap up and may, um, before perhaps taking people, listening to you know other people's input and thoughts and questions and so on, um, I'd certainly not had a look at um, had a look at this until about the last couple of weeks when I saw the RPCMU version out there and thought I'll download that and have a play because I don't have a Raspberry Pi of any sort, so the Raspberry Pi distros are largely useless to me, unfortunately. Um, something I probably should rectify at some point. Um, and overall, it feels like it's definitely a step in the right direction um, if, in terms of actually bringing new users into Risk OS. Um, we've got, finally got a distro that we can actually give to people that's ready to go out the box, a bit like the, a bit like the rule one, but maybe with more of a kind of uh, project behind it to, to sell it. Um, and it comes with it comes with other support as well. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that there are the video series. If you go to Tom Williamson's Wi-Fi Sheep YouTube channel, you'll find there's three videos so far, um, which are about 10, 10, 10, 10, 20 minutes long each, varying they vary depending on the one. The first one is how to how to create how to create an SD card if you've downloaded a file off a website, how to get it boot risk OS booted up. The second one is how to how to get started with risk OS, how to configure it, how to find your way around the filer and so on. And the third one is looking through the emula emulators folder. So it's actually getting BBIT up and running. It's getting Acorn mode up and running. It's playing with games. I think you may get DOS box started as well. Um, and he takes you through with with screen with good sc um, screen capture so you can see what he's doing on the screen with the mouse and so on. And he talks you through it. Which is great. It's exactly the kind of thing we we should be doing to actually promote the platform and um, you know get people get people interested. Um, with that, though, I have to say there were just a few potentially reservations, which I guess could be um, could well be addressed by our uh, by risk cost developments in in sort of version two of this of this release. Um, even as a sort of seasoned risk OS user, it's actually quite difficult to find stuff in this. Um, one of the things that does irritate me a little bit, partly just because I'm quite familiar with updating the risk cost open builds on a, on a couple of systems here fairly regularly when they come out, is that they've shuffled stuff around. So, for example, if we go into utilities, you'll find Flasher and MemNow, which both come in, diver in the diversions folder as part of the standard build. And they chuck stuff in the same folders as stuff that comes from Riscos Open. So blocks comes from Riscos Open. Countdown is something provided by a third party. It's written by Chris Hall. Doku is written by Jeff Doggett, I think. Doom is Jeff Doggett. Hopper comes as standard, which, if you want to go and upgrade the system later, makes it actually quite difficult to do because you suddenly have to start copying individual applications around on um, on disk from the download archives. And it's a sort of personal preference thing, but I. My personal preference is to keep the third party stuff separate from the operating system and to make life a little bit simpler. But I can understand why they've done this because it keeps all the stuff in one place. Um, that said, some of the categorizing does feel a little bit arbitrary, and I did wonder whether they need, really need, needed app utilities, graphics, 
when they could perhaps put them put all the things in one folder or a couple of folders. Um, the other thing which was a little bit confusing, I kind of touched upon briefly when I was we were looking at the um, audio video folder, was the way that all the install files for things have just been dumped in the folders with the applications, even though it's already been ready installed and set up and ready to go. We've actually got a folder in here called Documents, um, which contains a folder called Sources, and that contains the source file, source code for applications for some of the applications which require the source code to be distributed. Um, and to me, it would make, maybe make more sense to use have a similar approach and just put the download archives in a separate folder out of what tucked out of the way somewhere. Um, so the user isn't faced with having to wonder what the modules folder is with digital CD and what do they do with system and what does DCD res do and oh they double clicked on it and that's suddenly broken digital CD because it's now looking at the wrong resources folder and things like that. So the, all the files are there and they're available and they're documented but they're not actually placed in front of you at the time. Um, I couldn't also help but notice that the source code list setup does seem to be slightly incomplete in that there's some applications there. I know for a fact should really have a source code included on the disk image and they don't. Um, although to be fair again they do point you at websites but it's much easier just to put everything on the image because it makes the licensing a lot simpler and a lot less headachey in the future. Um, and I guess the final point which, is, which I did notice from the videos was that there's a certain lack of um, documentation actually available for the new user. If you, plug, if you plug this in into your Raspberry Pi, you boot it up, you arrive at this desktop, you read the disclaimer which just says that nothing's their fault, and maybe you click on host on SDFS to open up or hostfs to open up the root of the hard drive, you get the re, you get a bundle, a readme for the system, um, which points you towards Wi-Fi sheets videos, which is probably a good thing. Um, but it doesn't point you towards much other documentation. So there's a bit of a kind of leap of faith, which I'm pretty sure all of us can jump over because we all know how to use RiskOS. But if you didn't know how to use RiskOS, you're pretty much forced to go and watch the videos to understand how to find your way around the filer, to find out that the scroll wheel on the mouse actually is a menu button, for example, which is not obvious at all to somebody who's never used the system. Um, and I just wonder whether perhaps there could be more documentation available, which I guess is down to resource and time and who's going to write it. Um, and the final thing that I didn't I didn't like with the videos, which may just be a, a personal thing, but the Acorn and Risk Cost Limited, uh, Risk Cost Development since then, and Risk Cost Limited as well, have always stuck to a standard style guide, and everything's got a fixed name. So your left mouse button is select, your right mouse, right mouse button, right, the right mouse button is adjust the middle one's menu. All the interactive help is written like that. All the documentation is written like that. In the videos, they refer to them exclusively as left left mouse, right mouse, and middle scroll wheel. And there's no indication at any point during them that there might be a there might be alternative names. Um, and similarly, and you rather than having a close icon on Windows, you get the X button, which it is. It's an X in the standard in the standard um, theme. But if you go and look at interactive help, or you go into the documentation, they'll call it the close icon. That's never mentioned. And again, I just there may be there may be that perhaps it needs more input from a wider pool of people who to check the documentation and perhaps feedback and help help improve it and help pick up the issues that you know new users new new use of the system may well find. Um, but then again, if we have if it's, if it's bringing any new users, then I guess they can let us know when they uh, when they join when they join in and get involved. Um, but that. <laughs> That is basically risk OS Direct in a nutshell. Um, it's certainly worth a look if you've not if you've got a Pi sitting around and haven't played with it. Um, if you wanted to download RPCMU and have a play with that as well, that's definitely also recommended. Um, and if you haven't been using RPCMU recently, the improvements to that with networking and so on make it a much more usable system. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worth going to have a look. Um, will I be turning? It, will I be using it as my daily desktop? Probably not, but just because I'm so used to the way risk OS has always worked. But it's definitely functional and it a surprising amount of, of it does work out of the box, which is something that risk OS historically has been incredibly bad at. So yes, well done and
I guess I'm looking forward to version uh, release two whenever that may come along. Which I think pretty much brings me to the end of what I have to say. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any uh, any thoughts or questions. Steve, um, can I just um, prompt you to perhaps tell us a little bit about the setup that you're using there? Because I think you're on a Linux machine, aren't you? Is that right? Um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so. The demo I'm, what I'm doing tonight has all been done on, on Ubuntu Linux machine. Um, I use RPCMU quite a lot because it's actually pretty much my daily machine now. Um, for those who don't know, my Riscos my Riscos main actual native Riscos machine is Titanium, which I use pretty much 50-50 these days alongside RPCMU on Linux. Partly because RPCMU, I'm much happier at sticking new ROM images in, um, so I'll keep the nightly builds and rule going into that, and there's no danger of turning the titanium into brick by doing it. Um, so this is running in RPCMU alongside that. Um, deliberately to try and keep it simple on the, sc on the screen here, I've um, stuck to a low screen resolution to try and keep the bandwidth and screen sizes small for people who are looking at it across Zoom. Um, but all I've done this evening is um, share my RPCMU screen with, with Zoom and hopefully it's appeared as a risk risk desktop on in front of you on your computers. It certainly looked good from this end. <laughs> um, Does anybody have any uh, questions that they'd like to stick in? Uh, stick your hand up and I'll unmute your mic from here. <laughs> oh, uh, okay, Ruth, this is Chris Quinn. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, because. Okay. Uh, right, <clears throat> Steve, just a general um, comment um, about the way it's worked tonight. It's been really good from my point of view, but there is, it just sounds as there's a thunderstorm going on in the background. And I don't know quite where that's coming from. You mean a, a constant rumbling, Chris? Yes. We noticed that earlier on and we've tried to find out whose mic it is. But I've got everybody mute except Steve, so we can blame Steve. Is that any better now, like that? Yes, it's gone now. Ah, OK. Apologies in that case, that's my fault. We should have shouted earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, but as a vehicle for a meeting, it seems to work very well, Steve. Yeah, that's encouraging. Um, so I've never tried doing anything. I've done... I've now got... Elsewhere, I've got a fair bit of sort of background to doing Zoom group meetings that would have been sat in a sort of face to face around a table, but we've never done anything technically like this. So it's interesting, it's good that it sort of appears to work. And we've also got a better turnout than we've had in years. <laughs> it was, one thing we did notice when we were starting to collect the list of names together was we're probably about 50 50, I think, split between people who are too far away to get to Wakefield meetings normally and um, people we, we see at the club on a, on a monthly basis. So it's been nice to see a few new faces that um, the people that normally only get the newsletter from us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Um, did I see? Um, oh, yeah, uh, I'm going to Derek Barron. Hi, Steve. Hi, Derek. I'm, I'm unmuted now, right. Um, I was asking. Uh, I run a, just a PC with virtual acorn on it. So I could download this image, could I, and, and run it on my PC? It looks interesting. Um, yes. Is it a Windows machine you've got, presumably? Yes. Yes. Um, there's, it's actually even easier on Windows because they, they um, RP, if you go to the RPCMU website, I'll, I'll bung links out on the club forum and probably on the meeting page um, after tonight so that people can um, get access to some of these links. Um, we'll stick them in the newsletter as well. Um, if you go to the RPCMU website um, and go to downloads, and I think you scroll to the bottom of the downloads page, um, you should find what they call Easy Start Bundles. And for Windows, there's one that's ready made with, a ready, with all the software actually installed as well. So all you do is download it and run it. Wow. If, you, if you're on Mac OS or Linux, you have to compile it yourself. <laughs> but if you're on Windows, it's ready built. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else? Um, coming to David G. 
David, I think you're... Are you on mute now? Yep, you are. I can hear you. I was just going to say, there's actually a Mac version that you don't need to compile. I can't remember exactly where it is, but somebody's created a Mac version that doesn't need to compile. Yeah, that's correct. But for the Easy Start bundles, they use the cop-out of saying, supply your own compiled version. You have you would have to you have to move the Easy Start bundle and install that, install the program. It's that's right, yeah. Inside the yeah. app. Yeah, so you have to copy it across, whereas the Windows version, I think, comes already assembled just to go. It does, yes. Yeah. But yeah, it's not it's not difficult on any platform. I mean, to be fair, our PCMU now is so easy to get up and running on any system that it, if you've got another machine around, it's well, well worth it. If only for running nightly builds from Riscos Open and playing about with the latest features of the operating system and trying to break it, which is what they want us to do. Any further questions? Oh, yeah, Please. Peter Richmond, Peter Richmond. You may need to unmute yourself, yeah. There we are, that's it. <laughs> you can go on there eventually. Yeah, thanks very much, Steve, for that. Uh, comprehensive as ever. Uh, I didn't realise Pac-Man uh, did what it did. I, I mean, looked very sort of techy as a, a thing, but yeah, keeping everything up to date in one place, nice and easy. Uh, yeah. Because it's probably worth highlighting the Pac-Man for those who have not looked at it since it used to be quite controversial. Um, recent versions, you can actually put the file, the app, install the applications wherever you want on your hard disk. In the past, it would tell you you're storing this in apps and you're storing this in utilities. But nowadays, you can say to it, "I want to put this, I want to put this application here," and that's what they've done on the on Riscos Direct. They've actually put the files where they, the applications where they want to on the on the on the hard disk, but mm -hmm. left Pac-Man keeping track of it. Right. It would be nice if they told us that in the documentation anyway, because I only <laughs> found it when I went looking to see what Pac-Man was up to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I'd have to say as well that I give the distribution that they've got 9 out of 10, and it's pretty close. But as you say, extra documentation, assuming you know nothing, and maybe the first thing is, read me first, uh, comes up, shows you two pictures of mouse, the two possible ways you could do it. And the fact you can make it left-handed as well, can't you? Yeah, I don't so then know, it be backwards. I don't know what the relationship is between them and RPCMU in this, because if you've seen the Raspberry Pi build, it used mm -hmm. to have an extremely controversial um, backdrop, um, sort of. I'm not going to reshare really the screen partly because I'm actually looking at people on. I can't right. all and share the screen at the same time, but kind of yeah. up top left, kind of level where it says Risco, where it's been saying Risco direct all evening on, uh -huh. on the pin board. There was actually a picture of the mouse that said, I think it, that may actually have said select menu and adjust on it. Um, right. A couple of spelling mistakes, which were pointed out to them at the Southwest <laughs> show. Um, <laughs> but that seems to have gone on this board. And I don't know whether that's because they got so fed up with the feedback about the spelling that they removed it, or whether it's just because RPCM didn't like it. Um, yeah. But it's not on this version, but it was on the Raspberry Pi version. So it may be there's a little bit more information in the Raspberry Pi build. Um, I did, in order to do this, I did actually download the Raspberry Pi and stick it on an SD card and then try and compare the files. Right. But it was, I couldn't see anything else that was different, but I may yeah. have missed the pinboard backdrop or something like that somewhere. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, as I say, it, it seems very comprehensive, uh, but maybe yeah, a little bit more for. I've never seen a, a, a three-button mouse and used it in in this way, sort of thing. Yeah, and possibly promoting clubs around the country as well. Yeah, I guess, and that would be uh, something perhaps we can suggest to them. Um, as far mm. as the, as far as the mouse and keyboard point goes, um, that is something that Tom does cover in his first video. Yes, um, yeah. he uh, fish, he fishes out a uh, mouse with a scroll wheel and says, "This is kind of what you want. Do not use a Mac mouse with a single button because it will be incredibly mm. painful." Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't use a Mac keyboard because there's issues, hardware issues with those, and so on. So he does talk through that on the um, on the videos. Yes. The problem, yeah. the problem I had with the videos was that the terminology was so alien to what Risk OS users are familiar with, because um, he never so he never talks about select menu and adjust. He talks right. about first for applications as being as being plings, I think, rather than. It does mention plings, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and he. It, it, I think the whole thing would work better if the terminology of the videos was edited so that it matched the user guide and all the documentation that comes with our software and all the interactive help and everything because application authors have spent kind of 25, 30 years following Acorn's rule 
most of us most of the time yeah. um and that's a lot of history to suddenly obliterate and try and rewrite overnight yeah but i can also see the way he's looking at it that if you've never seen these three, three words you're going to use left right, middle and right yeah. aren't you you know it's just so. as soon as you try and read for yourself in any application documentation or anything else you're going to suddenly find these alien words select menu and adjust and no clue yeah. to what they mean which is yeah I think it's like, well, if you're trying to write any manual, it's sort of something I keep threatening to do, is uh, do your terminology and give your explanation straight away. So, you know, yeah. say, right, well, I'm going to use left, middle and right, and it's select menu and adjust, and we're going to use select menu and adjust from now on. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, yeah. this sort of stuff takes time. I mean, oh yeah, manual takes, so I find manual writing takes many drafts before I'm happy with it. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, being a bit, it's a bit unfair to criticise for the first release of this, which was almost certainly pushed out for a deadline of an unmovable Miscoist event as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Steve, yeah. Do we have any more questions from anyone? Wave, wave at me. <laughs> wave at me if you... Ah, uh, coming Brian. to... Uh, sorry, coming to Rick. No, no go to Brian, I will question it was just to wrap up but if there's more oh. questions then go for it it wasn't really, it wasn't really a question i was just thinking about saying you know on the pi version has the picture on the background showing the menu and you know select menu adjustment for the mouse and i wonder if they took it off for the rpcmu version because one of the default settings of rpcmu is to swap the middle and the right buttons anyway so that picture on the background would have been completely wrong wouldn't it Yes, that's, that is true, because um, I, I, I forgot about that, because my copies of RPCMU tend to get reconfigured very quickly to be yes. uh, to be more standard. But So, yeah, that could that could make sense. Um, to be fair, the RPCMU documentation throughout does pretty much say any deviations from what you get in the Raspberry Pi version are our fault. <laughs> Don't um, blame us, not them, and that sort of stuff. So there they probably are other changes as well. And again, I think they've done a really good job of making it work as smoothly as it does on RPCMU, to be fair. I guess the only other thing I always think when I look at those is the fact that they've got ShareFS turned on, which is a bit pointless given it doesn't work, or yeah. not very easily. Um, but the fact that ShareFS, of course, labels its icon as disks, which I've seen novice users get confused and click on that and wonder why their disks don't appear. Yeah, that's <laughs> really ought to say net or something or shares or something, anything other than disks. Yeah, there's, there's a few... It's, it's, it's so much of risk OS that we just assume we understand because we know how to use it. And as soon as you put it in front of a new user, it, you suddenly realize how it's confused me in the past simply because I've never used ShareFS. And I was like, why is this the icon called Disks? Is that? Anyway, that's not a risk cost development issue. That's a general risk cost one. Any further questions? Hands up, wave at me, attract attention. <laughs> Okay, uh, that looks like looks like it's a wrap then. Rick, just before you wrap up, yes, um, I think it's as well. I'd just like to thank Bernard for passing on a load. Of, um, I think if, if you're on the club forum, you'll have seen an, an email yesterday he sent with a link to an archive article um, or proposed archive article. So I'd like to thank Bernard for sharing his thoughts on this as well. It was quite encouraging to see that I, he and I appear to be thinking in similar kind of directions on this um, in terms of first impressions, which is nice. Um, and I suspect there may well be further discussion on this, maybe on the club forum at some point going forward, if anybody wants to uh, air their thoughts in future. Um, there is some discussion about where we can try and have more public discussions about risk cost direct with, um, with risk cost development. Um, that's ongoing at the moment. Um, but I guess any feedback from people that, that will help improve things would be welcomed by Richard, Andrew and Tom. Okay, is that it? That's, I think that's all I've got to say. So, yeah. yeah, well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> it all went very well. The, the Risk OS desktop um, appeared very good, very crisp, and, and the mouse movements and everything surprisingly smooth, actually. Um, yeah. And as for the distant uh, thunderstorm, it was a very distant one. Don't worry about that. But Ruth and I were just chatting about that, uh, wondering what it was. Um, but it was not severe. Uh, what are you going to? You don't have to answer this, but would you like to confess what it was? Um, there's a desk fan at the other side of the room, which now I thought it was that. <laughs> um, 
because I thought <laughs> the ventilation in this room is in the sort of office where the networking is isn't particularly great because I don't have, don't have a big window to open. So. Oh, right. Fair enough. I well, I spared you the little desk fan right on the desk next to the microphone and stuck it on the, on the table at the, the other side of the room. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you need, Steve. One of them. <laughs> what is it? It's an AKG C three thousand studio mic. <laughs> oh, I, oh god, you're very proud of that, aren't you? Yes. I am very proud of it. <laughs> yes. Um, incident, uh, Ruth, there. Uh, she appears to be on the planet Gallifrey, but in reality, she's on the outskirts of Sheffield. I'm on the outskirts of Wakefield and Steve's on the outskirts of Leeds. And um, the rest of you are scattered over quite a bit of the UK. So hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. Um, it's gone, I have to say, dare I say it, rather better than we dared hope, actually. Um, several of us have used Zoom before. Not a great deal in my case. Um, Steve's probably the one who's used it the most, but we've never tried doing this before. Um, seems to have worked rather well, thank goodness. Um, better from my point of view, because many of you may not know I'm partially sighted, and so at club meetings I can't see the screen unless I were to sit about three feet from it and get in everybody's way. Um, but I can see it very well on my own screen here. So in a sense, it's for me, it was a, kind of better, really. So uh, I think we'll be, we've got a committee meeting next week. So I think we'll kind of review this and wonder whether we can make better use of it. Um, not just because of the club being, um, you know, unavailable for face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, hmm. Right. That's it, really. So, Sorry, Rick. I was good. This is worth saying in that front. There's obviously been some discussion on the club forum anyway about this up to, in the lead up. If anybody's got any thoughts or feedback they'd like to give us, either drop us an email to the committee, stick it on the club forum. Um, send it to me as editor of the newsletter and we'll start a discussion going there probably, yeah. the, probably the most direct route but yeah any feedback because you're all members and we'd like to hear what you think and you know what those of you who can't make it to meetings regularly would like us to do as well yes I'd agree with that and of course we're always looking for articles for the newsletter because we're trying to keep it going as a, a monthly production and so far that's working but you know it, it doesn't just happen we have to keep badgering people for articles we're so good for, we're good for june he's got a bit delayed because i was putting this talk together but i'll be back onto that probably from tomorrow mm. um the, uh, the copy for july and august would be appreciated if anybody fancies writing anything okay well thanks for that so good evening everybody thanks very much for attending um, just a note to Ruth, we're not sure as to which of us the video recording on, on whether it's going to be on your machine or mine. I think it's on yours. I'm fairly certain it was on yours. Yeah, you. well, when, when they close the meeting, it will then actually tell you that it's saving it and it takes quite a long time to save. So we'll, we'll know um, and we'll figure out a way of, if it is on my machine, and figure out a way of getting it to you if it's a huge file. It will be. <laughs> Drop yes. <box. laughs> Drop it, might, it might be a USB stick and a carrier pigeon. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. See you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.